to welcome all of you again to this uh, session. And I'd like to express my deep gratitude to Chris Hutton for finding the time, first of all, to write the book that will, focus, that will be the main focus of our discussion. And then too, for his willingness to take part in this discussion. Chris Hutton's research focuses on political issues in language and linguistics. At present, he is investigating the links between linguistic theory and race theory, and the history of race theory following on from his 1999 book of linguistics and ideology in Nazi Germany, which we are going to be discussing, linguistics and the Third Reich. In addition to this interest in the history and politics of Western linguistics, Chris is pursuing various projects at the intersection of linguistics, law, and intellectual history. The focus in this work is on issues of legal definition and classification. Okay. His publications um, include Race and Drake, Definition in Theory and Practice with Roy Harris. Okay. It's the Oh, okay. Language meaning and the law and more okay, recently. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I think we have some uh, uh, um yes, if you if maybe you could kindly uh mute your mics so that we have no noise in the background. Thank you. Right, okay. Then more recently has published two books, Integrationism and the Self, Reflections on the Legal Personhood of Animals. And, the, and then the other book is The Tyranny of Ordinary Meaning, Cobbett versus Cobbett, and the Invention of Legal Sex. Um, under preparation is a book-length study of the concept of IEN. Yes. Chris, um, I would like to engage in an informal discussion with you. Uh, concerning this book, but let me provide a bit of a bigger context from where, uh, uh, where I stand. L last month, we looked at the book on language colonialism and capitalism by, uh, by Monica Heller and Bonnie McQueen. What was interesting about it was that they were trying to provide an account of the historical evolution of uh, sociolinguistics, language studies, and African studies in Canada and North America. But you shift to, um, to Nazi Germany. So in a sense, uh, the two books are linked in that in both cases, we are looking at uh, the development of linguistics or ideas about language in very specific localities in, during very specific historical periods. That is the general word, um, the general idea. And there's a colleague of mine uh, at the University of the Western Cape called Basi Antia, following from your work and um, Bonnie McQueenie and uh, Monica Heller. We are interested in trying to work out the history of ideas about language in different parts of the world in the global south. So we see our work moving forward as to some extent drawing quite heavily on your work. So that is where I, where I stand. But now let me uh, continue and ask very specific but pedantic questions. In the acknowledgments, Chris, you say, for example, that um, you learned many lessons in thinking laterally about linguistics from Roy Harris. I've got a couple of questions here. W what does it mean to think laterally in linguistics? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to answer that one first? Um, yes, yes, yes. I guess um, Harris had a way of picking up an idea and, and mm -hmm. um, decontextualizing it and analyzing it, mm -hmm. which was, uh, when I was a student, I found it very refreshing because mm -hmm. he didn't take anything for granted and he, he was a kind of intellectual historian himself. Mm -hmm. uh, so he had a way, I think, of placing discussions of linguistics in a wider historical social context. Mm -hmm. And um, that really caught my imagination, actually. Um, 
So, and I think also he just never, he never believed anything anybody said actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he just had, he was just a quant, quant, uh, quantarian, you know, he was a contrarian. He, uh, mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, mu I must say, when I started reading the linguistics of Nazi Germany, I was quite surprised mm -hmm. and shocked because it's actually quite normal in some sense. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that was challenging. And I think that, um, so Harris, I guess also the idea not to take as given the notion of a language, and I think which is mm -hmm. obviously important in your thinking about language and linguistics and, and this, so this is another way of looking at this notion of lang a language mm -hmm. in a very specific political social context and seeing actually the different kinds of effects this ideology can have or how it works itself out and the role the linguists play as ideologues. I think, mm -hmm. I think we, because North America is the default place and you know, I grew up in the sort of Chomskyan era where there was no direct connection between linguistics and social reality. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's obviously links you can draw, but you have to find them. And um, so I think by looking at Nazi Germany, uh, you can find these, you can see it much more clearly there and then think back about other contexts. Uh, okay, right. Let me um, take you back a bit. Because we are scattered across the globe, I have some idea about who Roy Harris is, but I think some other um, colleagues in the audience might not have. Can you just give us a bit of a background on who Roy Harris is and what do you think has been his contribution to, um, to linguistic scholarship? Uh, he uh, was professor of general linguistics at Oxford and uh, mm -hmm. he was in a way a very English establishment figure, but he was mm -hmm. also a a contrarian, as I said, and mm -hmm. he led a kind of mini revolt within the British academic establishment, uh, basically attacking what he saw as a, a central set of beliefs that linguistics fostered in the Western tradition. He did, normally talked about the Western tradition, mm -hmm. so that, there's an interesting debate one could have there. So mm -hmm. specifically the notion of languages as autonomous entities Mm -hmm. uh, called the language myth and mm -hmm. also the idea of that um, meanings that words were determinate in form and meaning and therefore there could be a class of experts called linguists whose job it was as it were to analyze and to uh, make authoritative statements about this object of study so what interested me partly was this notion of authority so mm -hmm. i think that's very relevant to southern theory in the sense that who has the authority in a particular society to pronounce upon and be an expert about language. And I, I, I mean, that's something I've thought about more in recent years, but it was definitely uh, implicit in, in his thinking. So um, he was extremely unpopular in British <laughs> linguistics. And uh, anyway, that's a long story, but he was basically shut out. Uh, but uh, um, he wrote, you know, he kept writing. He wrote maybe too much, actually. He also wrote <clears throat> influentially on writing, which is another central issue, I guess, if you're thinking globally mm -hmm. about, about um, literacy, writing. And uh, so, um, again, I think there he, he, again, he didn't take for granted uh, a definition of writing, for instance. So I think that's interesting and challenging. Um, mm. So even people who hate his general linguistics often find his work on writing very interesting and in and provocative yeah <clears throat> i think he was a bit before his time in a way because it's now become a kind of commonplace to attack the construct of the language you know <laughs> in a in a different political context so uh, mm. Mm. I mean, anyway, yeah. you, you know yeah. this as well as i do yeah, yeah. what's it, what what is interesting <clears throat> i think is how some of his ideas are beginning to permeate even to some extent mainstream applied linguistics. Uh, for example, um, the individuals who write about translanguaging now make it a point once in a while to make some reference that, oh yes, what Hardy said about a language myth, and they proceed and they say what they want to do. Um, this leads me to my other question. Do you think, for example, that um, 
Roy Harris uh, notions of intergressional linguistics are compatible with um, the popular views of uh, on, on, on translanguaging. Are two, uh, or are these two completely different projects? I think they meet at some point, but um, I think translanguaging, I think the political framework of translanguaging, Harris would probably not have felt comfortable with. Uh -huh. So um, I think some of, you know, the sort of, uh, maybe some of the identity politics or some of the, yes, yes, yes. Uh, he, he, in some sense, you know, that's why people read him as conservative, I think, because he's, uh -huh. He had a certain style and a rhetorical style, which is very at odds with people who do translanguaging. So, um, but I think there is an important genealogy to, to and he's part of that, to, mm. um, uh, to try and think of outside this construct of a language. And what does it mean? Mm. Uh, I mean, you're the one who, who was asking you know, a few years ago, what's, what's applied integrationism, you know? Mm. So, uh, in a sense, people are doing translanguaging, of, of, mm -hmm. I'm often thinking about actual classroom practice. Mm -hmm. so he didn't mm -hmm. go that far. No. He didn't go that far. Okay. Yeah. Right. Then the other thing that I found interesting in your book, um, in this book and in some of your writing, is the relationship between linguistics and race theory. You say, for example, that linguistics is both the parent and child of race theory. In, in a context um, in which issues about race, white supremacism, xenophobic, xenophobia are becoming increasing, are affecting all our lives, can you elaborate a little bit more on what you mean by saying linguistics here is both the parent and child of race theory? I was thinking um, if you look at the, say, the beginnings of race theory, I mean, it comes <laughs> partly out of comparative anatomy and uh -huh. And basically it took on a kind of, it took, it drew from ideas about folk and nationhood, which were really ideas that linguists and others were articulating. So I see that race theory sort of entered the European intellectual ideological mainstream, marked by its, uh, by ideas which come from a much older tradition about national character mm -hmm. and, and language and, and territory and so on. So, and then, um, so there's a kind of struggle in the 19th century between ideas about, which are sort of ideas of nationhood, language, territory, and sort of the hard race theorists who are looking at physical characteristics. This kind of intellectual confused, very confused battle. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but anyway, so what by the child, I mean that eventually race theory drops out because it becomes intellectually marginalized or after the second world war. So in a way, linguistics is still standing as a kind of arbiter of classifying people. Mm -hmm. It doesn't directly relate to what's happening in the US, I think, because I always think the US is, uh, it's both globally dominant and highly unusual in some ways, you know. Mm -hmm. So the debates, I'm, um, I was thinking more of the European context or perhaps the post-colonial context, mm -hmm. you know, where, so, um, I mean, that's a very sweeping statement, but I do think at least one thing is I think we should need to read the history of these two disciplines together oh, and, okay. and also um, see that the older, older lineage is the folk, the idea of folk, which yes. is in the Bible, actually. It's, mm -hmm. you know, language, lineage, territory, and culture. Uh -huh. so that idea, for good and ill, I mean, it, you know, is there permeating the Western tradition and get spread through colonialism and so on. Mm, mm. And it runs into this radical uh, new discipline called race theory or race science, mm. which says mm. actually uh, what you call a folk is a false unity. And actually you need to read nations through the prism of race. So uh, anyway, it's a, it's a very difficult story to get straight. I'm still struggling with it. So. Mm. But I think it's, um, it's a very important story for, for all of us at this point in time, I think, whether we are in Africa, Europe, or, or the United States, to be able to handle issues about linguistic theory and race theory, more or less concurrently, right? Yes. And, yes. yes. Um, 
following that then, my next question um, is this. You write somewhere that um, the, the pursuit of objective scholarly standards does not involve the rejection of prejudice. Now, when I was reading this, I was trying to follow, to understand what you meant here. Because you then proceed to say that um, the, the, the pursuit of uh, objective scholarly standards is a commitment to a different type of discourse. In other words, um, if I'm going to be reductionist, are you saying that I can be both a racist and a good linguist? Uh, in the terms of that period, yes. I think. In the terms of that period. Okay. In fact, it, I mean, this is a slight problem we have today. If you go through the history mm. of ideas, yes. most people were racist, right? I mean, um, mm. most people, you know, so um, I was thinking, you know, that, um, so expertise can formalize a kind of prejudice or it, it just can't, it, you know, there are so many people within, within particular contexts can't see something as a, as a prejudice even, right? It's so much part of their world that they can't step outside to analyze it. But they have a method and they have a, a sense of being an objective person pursuing the truth and, and they follow it. So it's sincerely, but it actually, when we look back, we see all these uh, mis things misshapen by ideology and so on. Because people will look back at us and say, similar things no doubt yes 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 but then you see that part is interesting because you say somewhere else that um the question of the status of objectivity of linguistics methodologically is complex and then you put in parentheses is not directly addressed in this book that's why i'm asking you now <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> however there's surely no reasons to argue that linguist linguistics enjoys any special autonomy in relationship to ideology. Now, let me try this on you. Um, the, you are then saying to some extent that linguistics is not objective. And you had just talked about issues of the native speakers, native speaker intuitions, natural language processing, etc. Are you then saying the since the notions of natural language processing, native speaker intuitions, etc., to some extent belong to psycholinguistics. Are you saying that psycholinguistics is an exercise in language ideology? With this, that it is covertly a language ideological artifact, although they don't say so themselves, that when they are talking of natural language processing, they are making ideological statements. I would have to say yes. I mean, but um, I think, I mean, the, the choice, the problem in linguistics is the moment you enter a, f a field of language and start labeling things, mm -hmm. you've inevitably fallen into an ideological you know, ac activity, right? And mm -hmm. so it's not really, it's not, it doesn't mean it's necessarily pernicious. I mean, I mm -hmm. think that should be said actually, mm -hmm. but in a context, you know, of a, of a, um, so, and then the idea of intuitions, which is there in Chomsky linguistics, yes. actually relates to romanticism and the notion that, that oh, okay. an untutored native speaker has these uh -huh. pure intuitions, and these can be drawn on by the technocratic linguist, you know, and so this, this is a very, you know, uh, it is an artifact of a particular ideology, yes, and, and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. not, you know, um, but I think there is a danger in just pointing the finger at people going, oh, ideological, ideological. <laughs> it's a, you know, it's a, you know, so, um, and it's also annoying to people when you do that. But uh, oh, oh, oh. I think any labeling, any labeling activity around language, like if you have a study and you say, one well, native speakers of French, you've already uh -huh. entered this, this complicated yeah. field, you know, of, uh -huh. because you've got to decide if someone comes to you from, from uh, you know, uh, Martinique or something, you say, oh, I yeah. know, like so on, all these problems will arise, you know, uh, which are not uh, apparent if you're sitting in the, in the met metropolitan capital necessarily, you know. Uh, and I think that's where the, you know, the US and English, because English is like the water that fish swim in, in a way, uh -huh. so, you know, which is very different from the cultural politics around language in, in most of the world, actually. Mm. Not mm. that there isn't politics around English in America.
Uh, anyway, okay. sorry, that was a rambling. Okay, this is, that was very helpful. Then the, the part that uh, I spent a lot of time uh, thinking about, reflecting, and agonizing um, was the following. And you'll see why. You say that Nazism was a, an ideological coalition. And one of the fundamental elements in that coalition was the defense of mother tongue rights. Nazism was a language rights movement. Now, this is where this thing, um, why I got a bit of uh, very interested, and uh, I wish I knew this 20 years ago. Um, because what you are pointing out here is that Nazism that was a language rights movement, of course, I mean, one hopes that not all language rights movements are Nazistic. Um, but the, you are pointing out how discussions about mother tongue rights and Nazism could coexist. And given the interest in language policy, language planning strategy of language rights, I thought this statement was very sobering indeed. Perhaps you could explain this a little bit more in, in the context of Nazi Germany. Right. Yeah, and, it relates. Uh, I think I have chapters on Weisgerber and Klaus. Yes, yes. And so the, I've been thinking about it a lot. The, the, the language politics of the interwar Europe are mm -hmm. such that, so radical nationalists in Germany and elsewhere, one of their main concerns is the language rights of Germans who are outside the German yes. state. Yes. And this is a right wing, this is on the whole a right wing, very ultra conservative. So it, it becomes, language rights become a tool for mm -hmm. threatening or intimidating neighboring states and also for a uh, kind of, so the Germans in those, so the fear is that they, these German speakers will be lost to the folk and will assimilate. And there's a similar fear about North America, but there's a, these are not neighboring states. So in the context of Europe, there are also territorial claims associated with this. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, if you look at Europe, even today, there are all these frozen territorial claims based on mm -hmm. language, basically, you know, Hungary, Romania, and so on, based on language or folk. So, so my point about, you know, Kloss is, explains this, because Kloss yeah. is a Nazi in Nazi Germany. When he comes to North America, it doesn't, there's a whole different context there where it's just about trying to maintain these uh, mother tongues within a, a different kind of um, governance framework. So it's not about fighting for territory. So yes. it's about trying to keep people's, um, you know, immigrant languages alive. So, so the framework is totally different, but within in the European context, in the interwar context, it was a far right sort of, it, mm. um, way of thinking about the Europe, the map of Europe. And mm. uh, so you, mm. you dream of basically reintegrating your lost speakers into the, mm. into mm. the nation. Um, mm. So that was one of the, you know, one of the strands of radical nationalism that feeds into Nazism. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Then you see, uh, it's, it's, it's good that you have now raised the issue about uh, close because that will be the last question that I want to, uh, to touch on before opening the discussion. You say that um, the case of Heinz Kloss raises a number of complex questions. Firstly, there are historical questions about the interrelationships and power struggles between various organizations. Then you proceed and say there is also the question of his own life and work and how he as an individual scholar fits into the complex set of institutional, social, and intellectual um, conventions. This leads on to the broader question of Kloss work does it make any difference uh, in its place within linguistics if we knew that he had a Nazi background? That is the question that is there. That, um, and let me explain why this is interesting or um, disturbing a bit to me. Um, in language policy and planning, which I, I do a bit of work in that area when I have time, um, one of the key unarticulated views is that it's a question, it's a quest for some form of social justice, right? That um, whether you deliberately go on all out to establish that future that you think you want people to realize, um, 
you don't you may not say that in every paper but generally that is the broader thing so when you then come up with uh, you meet figures like close who are nazi or who have a nazi background but who are also engaged in a similar enterprise what it does is that it forces you to rethink what is it about language planning and policy or linguistics that makes it so amenable to fascists uh, what is it about this discipline i mean coming from africa what is it about linguistics that makes it use that jacopolan stem historically viscerally tied to colonialism then you have got in this case in the book that you wrote what is it about linguistics that may tie it to fascism what is it about linguistics that ties it from extent to white supremacism because that sort of level of self-reflection is one that is being is sort of forced upon some of us by the current what development because you want to know what is it that makes this discipline at different historical epochs in different historical periods more amenable to this given the fact that there is the counter movement let's say of critical scholarship in which we are trying to change the world but there's still another dimension to it to apply to linguistics which ties it to all this fascistic movement right yeah, anyway yeah that um <laughs> i mean i've also i mean i've been looking at um if you look at fishman and weinreich you know after the yes. war mm -hmm. i just wrote a piece they, I looked at two articles by them and they, in, in Languages in Contact, Weinreich quotes about 20 Nazi linguists, you know. <laughs> and Fishman, I think, gets from Weinreich this long list of really nasty anti-Semites. So <laughs> and I'm not sure that Fishman, I think, but Weinreich, his father wrote a book about Nazi scholarship. And mm -hmm. he, so I, there's a bit of a puzzle there in, in mm -hmm. Weinreich, a real Weinreich. Um, his father, Max, wrote this book on, one of the first books on Nazi scholarship. Mm -hmm. So there is a weird, um, there's a little moment of continuity in, in American sociolinguistics mm -hmm. with uh, Nazi Germany. Not mm -hmm. in the actual idea, I mean, I'm not calling either Fishman or Weinreich, you know, anything like a Nazi, but, mm -hmm. but there is something odd about linguistics which you picked up, because it can work for language, it can work in a authoritarian state, say Leninist yes. state. It can work for the colonialism. It can work yes. for missionaries. It can mm -hmm. work for folkish Nazis. It can work for universalist Chomskyans, you know. Yes. So there's something very fascinating about this. Um, and I think, you know, this malleability, but also this set of assumptions that seem to run through all these different uh, streams. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think one thing that linguistics can allow you to think about is sort of this inter perfect integration of people. Mm -hmm. so, if you look at even Saussure, there's a kind of mind merge where we're all speaking the same language. Therefore, there's something powerful concept. You know, it's it's a so it can linguistics can be used to imagine forms of social integration, mm. Uh, mm. and that of course can be used politically in many different ways. In different ways. In, you yes. know, in a post-colonial context, you're striving for to renew or to reform into to mm. reintegrate. You know, whereas in Nazi Germany, you're there's also a sense that modernity or the West or whoever, universalism attacking the roots of your culture. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's actually full of paranoia and fear, Nazi Germany, about, you know, you have France, this is universalism, mm -hmm. you have um, Anglo-American capitalism, and uh, which are kind of Jewish in their mind, you know, and universalist. And so they, they feel um, illegal. That's why they assert this culture of difference which linguistics also allows you to do, because it gives you a way of mapping a conceptual world. So Weisgeber can show you, oh, we're different. Look at our conceptual patterns. They're different from these yours, you know, from the, from English and so on. So, but I, you know, I thought, you know, there should be more writing on um, Leninist states or whatever you want to call them, yes. Vietnam, China, Laos. I mean, these are, I mean, there is some, but I think the anthropologists have done much more in actually looking at how these, uh, because China and Vietnam are both, um, they both basically are, use linguists and anthropologists to set up these cast social categories of you know, so-called minorities. So, mm -hmm. so, so in China, you have Russian Soviet linguists in China in the 50, early 50s, mm -hmm. who were basically mm -hmm. advising about how to organize the, uh, the nationalities policy. So this is, mm -hmm. there is, you know, not much literature, there's a bit in English, but not, 
I mean, this is one of the biggest language planning policies in world history. You've got the whole of China, basically. Yes. You know, yes. Anyway, so um, uh, I think there is, a, there is a sort of political history of linguistics to be written, you know. Uh, yeah. Not by me, I would do all the things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for this wonderful conversation. I will now hand over back to Magda um, um, to open up the conversation to everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. McConey. So I have already two questions in the chat, so um, I will uh, quickly read them so that Dr. Hatton will have time to address them. Uh, question number one. This is a very interesting book which clarified a lot of things for me, especially why I felt uncomfortable with psycholinguistics approaches to second language acquisition, as I could not identify with the idea of ultimate attainment slash advanced intuitions. Uh, after reading this book, I sort of get it. However, looking at it in the current context where there is a reawakening of racial violence I find myself wondering if linguistic is uh, both a parent and child of race theory, what does it mean to teach linguistics as if black lives mattered? Wow. <laughs> uh, hmm. Right, 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 okay. I'm sort of hampered because I'm sitting in Hong Kong. We have a <laughs> <laughs> and I, um, I do think, you know, um, for me, one answer is, and it's not a good answer, is to go into the history of things. Because mm -hmm. I think then when you look at the history, you do see these latent ideologies, which when you face with, you know, when you're looking at something as a practice discipline, a lot of, mm -hmm. you, know, you get all these concepts which are then applied and the, um, I, I, that's why I found history to be so useful because it reframes things and you can also trace the institutional history of ideas. And then, you know, that's why, you know, um, so I don't have a good answer to this question mm -hmm. because I'm mm -hmm. so out of the context, but obviously, um, you know, and I, I back to my point about labeling, I think this is mm -hmm. one of very difficult mm -hmm. issues because intuition where, you know, in, intuitions about things and, the, the idea that cognitive processes are somehow inside the head. This is, mm. you know, this, this is something which uh, tends to depoliticize and to decontextualize. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't have a good answer, honestly, but, uh, I, you know, um, mm. I, I do find the, the way, his, reading the history of ideas tends to mess things up and make life more difficult, which I think is what we, you know, and challenging, which is a kind of thing that we're going through right now in, in different ways in different societies. Mm. Uh, and I think mm. some of the most commonplace things that are in front of us are the things that we need history in order to look at them properly, which is back to the Harris. I think Harris mm. had a way of taking a commonplace idea and walking around it and, and standing back from it and giving it a lineage, um, not always in the political way, but, and I think that's something uh, which we can do with ideas in these um, in these disciplines, you know, uh, in the disciplines that we have. Um, right. I don't know, Sintri, if you want to add. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah um, I know the person who asked that question. I live with it, but anyway, the the issue I think for me there are two sets of issues here. Let me focus on the native speaker intuitions, then I'll move on to the issue and discussions about the Black Lives Matter. I've always wondered, for example, I think people in the audience can, can help me here, whether in other languages, for example, whether it's Afrikaans or whether it's Swahili or Arabic, whether there's, uh, there's an equal preoccupation with discussions about native speaker intuitions, or this is one of those bizarre phenomenon that is associated with English only. Because I'm not sure, for example, when I encounter um, speakers of African languages, 
that being a native speaker of an African language matters at all. I'm not sure um, about that. Uh, my other colleagues may correct me on this. What I'm trying to say is that I think what is happening here is that there are certain ways of thinking about English, um, which then get transposed to other languages. And that's one way of, of that's my initial view about it. Then the issue about ultimate attainment. I think uh, ultimate attainment raises fundamental problems because the institutions will always find a way of saying you have not met the criteria because the ultimate, it's not you who determines whether you have met that uh, criteria, it's somebody else. So when, when second language acquisition is talking about ultimate attainment, I think what, they, um, what they've done there unintentionally is to buy into the institutional nature of language learning without saying so, all right? Because it is the institutions which determine ultimately whether you have met that particular criteria. The, the challenge about the Black Lives Matter thing, um, what it does, I think, is this is that I don't see how courses in applied linguistics or in linguistics in the US um, in, the, in fall and beyond will not include a discussion about issues about language and race. You could take a, a teacher course in social linguistics in the US and avoid discussions about race, talk about language and ethnicity, language and class. But what the Black Lives Matter people have done is to force us to, uh, to think through what uh, is the impact of aspects about race and language in terms of the work that we do. That's how I, uh, uh, that's how I see it. Um, yes. Okay, yeah. Oh. Oh, Raj has a question, Raj. Yeah. Hello, you, you talking to me? Yes, yes. I, I, I thought I saw you writing a question somewhere. Yeah, 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 that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, Professor Hutton, very nice to be talking to you like this. I met you some years ago in Hong Kong during yeah, okay. his Hong Kong that conference. I still remember that day. Used uh, to be here again. Uh, the question that I've, I've always wondered is, uh, I mean, I've, I've been thinking of your a claim that you made in several places to the effect that we as linguists, we are somehow still stuck in the 19th century mentality. That yeah. linguistics is basically a 19th century discipline and we have been moved from that. And I think it's pretty true, you know, we can, we can still trace uh, uh, effects of 19th century thinking in our thought. My question now is, is it at all possible to come out of that free? Are we still stuck? Are we destined to be stuck in that, that kind of thing? Is it at all possible to start with a clean slate, as it were, a clean slate, and rethink the whole of lang what language is all about afresh? I would like to hear you, your opinion. Yeah, um, it's much easier to criticize that to propose, but I, have, I, have, I do think the translanguaging is an attempt to get out of this mm -hmm. legacy. Um, mm -hmm. I also think that um, Boy Harris tried very hard by um, by talking about the radical, radically contextual nature of language, and therefore, mm -hmm. so the whole assumptions of 19, the nineteenth-century scholarship, you know, in a way, fall away because mm -hmm. we're left with a with something which is much more um, provisional, transitory, and constructed micro-socially, as you know. Um, I guess, uh, you know, it sort of relates to the question before, you know, are, they, are we, to what extent are we prisoners of the categories? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, and I, yeah. uh, and I think again, this has to be looked at institutionally and also by, you know, in terms of different uh, national contexts as well. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I do think, you know, Harris was an Oxford professor, so he's in the sort of, you can sit in Oxford and say languages are constructs and so on, but it's, you know, and it's an intellectually very powerful statement. But if you're on the, let's say you're doing a, 
an English language test in China because you want to study in the US. Well, that may be gone anyway. <laughs> um, you can't, you don't have the luxury of, of thinking that rules are, you know, rules are, you know, constitutive reifications, you know, mm -hmm. and um, there is a whole institution of language testing, you know, which is, which is a global money making machine. So, and uh, as Simphi was saying, in a sense, there's an institutional rationale for that, which we all partly buy into, right? I mean, we, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I feel, I don't, um, I don't have a, you know, I don't have a good answer. I mean, I've also thought a lot about lexicography as a mm -hmm. way because I've been toying with the idea of doing weird dictionaries, you know, which actually yeah. I'm always struck when you're looking, when I'm looking, trying to follow the Hong Kong situation and I look in my Chinese dictionary, I can't find most of the concepts that are being circulated <laughs> in society. Uh, and so that, that is maybe a more, you know, so I started making my own list, you know, my own kind of guerrilla dictionary. So, um, <laughs> so that is a, it's not theoretically exciting maybe, but it's actually, I think, you know, lexicography and, and what it means to document and, and language is also something which we can think about and um, mm -hmm. let's give a certain amount of scope to, to think differently, you know, um, but then in a way we still, you know, the 19th century is, the whole 20th century is about deconstructing the 19th century, the post-war 20th century. It was about trying to get out of the 19th century and it's been a, a very difficult struggle, I think, you know, including the mm. nation state order, you know, and, mm. Uh, mm. and the disciplines and so on. Mm. But thank you for your question. I, I thank you very much. I haven't answered it well. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, thank you. So I have more questions in the chat box. Um, some of you, you don't have your names, um, but just numbers. So um, uh, I will read the, the, the second question that I, that, uh, I see in the chat. Um, as a South African, I was obviously struck by the knowledge I had of the assumptions about the special place of the mother tongue and how it also played out in South Africa during the apartheid time. As an African, I was also struck by the notion that in that dispensation, multilingualism was seen as something promiscuous. What I wondered was, uh, what I wondered about was, what do we know about the place of mother tongue in pre-colonial Africa? For example, what would the place of the mother tongue be in the pre-colonial Africa before its contact with these European ideas? For example, uh, as those expressed in the Third Reich. Uh, yeah, so that's a sure. question. Um, there is a, a, a little follow up. I can also uh, not even begin to think about an answer, but I wonder if the world English's type of approach is not helpful. For example, remembering that there are many ways of making meaning. And when we teach linguistics to remember <laughs> to marvel at as many ways to make meaning as possible. Sure, the, the, um, I think Sinfri was hinting at the notion that you know, dividing the world into native, you know, people you meet as you move through a society, you know, dividing them into native speakers and non-native speakers is a curious artifact of maybe mm. a particular way of looking at language. I mean, um, there, is the, there is the sense, I think, that uh, missionaries and colonial administrations, mm. they didn't try and eradicate vernacular languages, but they did organize them and label them and they put them into position, social position. Um, and this concept of mother tongue, you know, I think is a European, originally a European mm. concept. Mm. And, um, but so then the, I think the, what, what colonial linguistics does it, it, it creates a situation or a set of dilemmas, which the post-colonial state in a way, cannot solve you know the almost insoluble mm. tangle and this is where fishman and others were much more optimistic in the beginning that they could somehow think about engineering better solutions i think this but actually the problems are much deeper and much more difficult mm. um i don't you know obviously i don't know about pre-colonial africa but i i strongly suspect that you can't find this mother tongue term Mm -hmm. you know, in yeah. Africa. But I, of course, I could be wrong. <laughs> I'm hesitant mm -hmm. to pronounce on this in this company or any company. But um, I think 
there is an idea, which it could also could be a romantic idea, that pre-colonial societies live in continua. And maybe that's also a romantic, you know, is that over romanticizing them, you know, because pre-colonial societies have their own language hierarchies, right? They have mm. so on. So I, I think there is an important and difficult question because we're trying to look back through this very powerful framework, which is European romanticism plus European universalism, which are both struggling within your linguistics, I think. This is the big battle. And it's very difficult to think yourself outside these, this, this kind of framework, you know. But um, so, and also I think, you know, if a, pre, a pre-colonial study, which is Islamic, say, would have, would have obviously a, a, a language hierarchy and a high language and, a, you know, a special uh, Quranic Arabic and so on. So there are all kinds of issues about religion or uh, authority and so on. So, I mean, Peter Mulhoys and others talk about the Pacific, and I think they saw these Pacific societies as sort of more egalitarian and in continua. You know, Dixon, I think all these, and they saw missionaries as creating hierarchies. So mm. I think this is a really key issue of the Southern theory and linguistics, but I, <laughs> that's about as far as I could go, I think. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, yeah. I, I'm willing to, uh, to risk my reputation and say the following. In pre-colonial Africa, you had communication, but it was not through mother tongues. What colonial encounters did, uh, one of the consequences of missionary intervention was then the creation of those uh, mother tongues, right? And the mistake made in, in language policy is that they then seek to try and facilitate communication through these mother tongues that were being created, right? But in most cases, most of the interaction is largely through communication. So the thinking is back to front, in a sense, that um, if you adopt a, an integrationist perspective, the primacy would be that in pre-colonial Africa, what you had was communication. And then the impact of education, formal education, missionary intervention, one of the consequences was then the creation of these various boxes called mother tongues that were the product of, uh, of communication. So in other words, mother tongues came after historically communication, right? And there's a lot of communication that takes place, but not necessarily through mother tongues. Right? That's, that's, uh, that's what I would say if I was put in a corner or if I put myself in a corner. Um, was, that is why I find integrational linguistics compatible with colonial linguistics. Integrational linguistics enables me to talk about the communication that was existing in the context in context in which there were no mother tongues. All right. Mm-hmm. That's, that that's, can be very liberating as a yes. It enables me to explain that particular that explain that, that particular paradox. Right. And it also then enables me to say, why is it that language policies, planning and policies are always failing? They're always failing because they're trying to consider as natural um, artificial categories called mother tongues when people in natural fact interact through communication. That the problem with the failures of the policies are, is not a question of lack of resources or implementation, it's a conceptual problem. Right. <clears throat> that it doesn't matter how many resources you're going to throw at the problem, as long as conceptually you have not resolved this ontological challenge between communication and language, that problem will keep manifesting itself at different stages throughout um, throughout human history. That's the way I, I want to think about it. That's why I'm interested more and more in discussions about ontological status of language or of a language. Mm-hmm. People become stakeholders, don't they, in those languages? Yes. yes. So there's yes. then there is a tussle because yes. in a sense they do take ownership of the labels and yes. and it may be the bargaining chip they have with the government in terms of resources or recognition. Yes. So it, it creates a anyway, I don't you know yeah. anyway. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, we have a- another question in the chat um, by Dr. Sangeta Bhagagupta. So maybe I will ask Dr. Sangeta to read the question, one of which actually was somehow already answered about the mother tongue construct. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, a little bit faint. Yeah. 
So this was a very interesting read. Um, and it made me think or rethink about stuff I've done on the construct of mother tongue. Uh, you've already uh, positioned yourself in terms of that this is a European one. I have colleagues in Asia who uh, use the concept mother tongue and that troubles me because they, they are using resources from five to six different uh, named languages. And, and of course, this is a circulation of uh, European con constructs that come to different parts of the world. So my question to you is what you write somewhere about Herder's 1772 construct, father and mother tongue. Why did that not catch on? How was this transition in the 19th century by Grimm into mother tongue? What happened to father tongue? So that's one part. And the other is that, isn't this construct a very monolingual one? And I, I particularly um, warm up to Sinfri, your, um, your previous comment on the ontological status of language, which is key, because unless we come to terms with what we are doing, we will continue to have neo-dualisms coming up. But I get the sense that mother or father tongue is something very central. Could you comment on these? And I have these three questions in the chat if you want to look at it, if I was not very coherent. You will. Um, I don't have a good answer. I, I, I know that the European romanticism is key in this because it, then you have this idealization of the bond between mother and child, the mother's milk, the language that you get with the mother's milk. So this is an, one of these interesting concepts, which although they're feminized, they also have a very hard political edge, I think. Um, so father tongue I discussed in terms of the um, Jewish identity and at least from the certain point of view, Hebrew and is patriarchal language. And um, so you have this uh, German anti-Semitism, which somehow mistrusts the Jewish model of identity, if I can generalize, which is from, the, from this nationalist point of view, oh, Jews can take on any nationality because they don't have a deep rooted loyalty to mother tongue because their identity comes from a textual tradition and a religious tradition. So, so there seems to be a bifurcation, you know, of, um, of some problem for, the, um, for this sort of Protestant mother tongue model with, this, with, the, um, with the father Hebrew as, as, as the, um, the key language of identity for Jews. You know? I mean, again, that's generalizing and it's the view from outside. But, uh, so I, I agree entirely it's a monolingual idea because you must protect the bond. This early childhood, this is Weisgerber, the early childhood mm -hmm. socialization is when you form the basic emote effective concepts that make you a member of the folk. And if there's some foreign father or the state language is foreign, then there's, this is threatened. So I think this is, an, this is a, this is where this anxiety, because it's not a natural link. It's a quasi natural link. It's not given in biology. It must be protected socially. And so, um, and so, uh, that's where I see the anxieties around mother tongue and monolingualism. So then you have all these studies showing that, you know, or that bilinguals are, have, you know, psychological uh, uh, cognitive problems or they can't, you know, so you get a kind of psych psycholinguistics that follows from that. So on Asia, I, it's interesting in Hong Kong, I mean, you hear people say Cantonese is the mother tongue of Hong Kong people. So the concept of mother tongue has been integrated into the politics of Hong Kong. So, I mean, that's just the way, I don't know. <laughs> so I kind of look, look on, I, I can't really, um, uh, you know, I, so I, I have difficult to, to, to say anything about that, except there it is, there's this concept, which has been integrated into the politics of this particular uh, space. And you, could, you can go back historically and say, there is no notion of mother tongue in Chinese in pre-modern, I, I, I challenged my colleagues in the Chinese department, you know, can you find this concept and uh, I, I don't think you can, um, but nonetheless, it's it's now integral to Hong Kong. So I know it's another of these problems of borrowing and so on. Um, I, there's more. I, I, I've. Uh, do you want to f remind me of um, 
what else you were asking. I'm sorry, I may have. Uh, but anyway, yes, the father tongue is a, I think it should be discussed more, yeah, because if, if you're German, if you're living outside the German state and the language of the, of the home is German, but you're living in Poland, then the father language in the sort of state sense is Polish and the school system and so on. So that's where you get the, this anxiety, which in a certain sense is fair enough, but nonetheless, uh, it has politically devastating consequences because from the German nationalist point of view, these states are threatening, you know, whole sections of the German people. So, so that's a kind of answer. There may be more to your question. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So I, I think European romanticism is right in there anyway. Yeah. Okay, uh, we have the next question from Dr. Judith Baker. So maybe Dr. Baker, would you like to ask your question? That is the next. Um, yes, thank you very much. To me, working on early child literacy, mother tongue becomes incredibly important, whatever you call it, because the language that the child acquires at home is such an enormous advantage to learning how to process text. And if you try to learn reading and writing, processing text in any other language than the one that you have all of the vocabulary and the, and, and, and the visualization and all that brain, uh, all that your brain contains, context and so on, it becomes very hard to learn, learn textual control. So I just wanted to ask how do we, uh, it, you know, look at both mother tongue and language and trans language from political point of view, but also from a brain development point of view. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I think I said in the book so because I was aware of this, you really need to look very closely at the context before, you know, so I would not mm -hmm. I would not say it would be ridiculous to say you know this this concept is intrinsically fascistic or something and i think there's perfect rationale to certain kinds of early language learning and childhood literacy so it's just that uh it struck me so hard reading basically this idea in nazi germany is an anti-semitic idea you know and and it's hidden but it once you think about it uh it has such a hard political edge but that doesn't that doesn't mean that, um, you know, other, the, you know, the sort of practice you're talking about, you know, I mean, it makes perfect sense what you said. So uh, I guess, you know, this is why it's a difficult, um, a difficult, um, you know, and challenging concept, I think, you know, it needs to be read in its political, social and pedagogical context. So because the notion of mother tongue is also a liberational concept in, in you know it mm. comes in the reformation and so on so against latin and the idea that people should participate in their own institutions in a language that they of socialization so i mean there's a there's a strong liberal tradition to this idea as well uh, so that's why it's difficult to get one's head around it i think you know mm. Um, mm. so uh, so i hope that's some kind of answer I mean, see this. yeah thank thank you i just it, it's just so hard when you talk to people when you're using something in many different ways. So there's, a, there's the, the anti-colonialist argument is hugely important. It's also important in language learning and early, early acquisition. And then you want to switch over to a translanguaging frame and I, it just seems to me that we don't have the actual language to make it clear to people. So it's very easy to get confused. I agree. And I, I was thinking about, you know, when I came to Hong Kong, there was a huge literature on how the, the education system, which is kind of mostly in English or, the, you know, the more high status bits of it and sort of a lot of students were struggling. So there was a whole literature about how this was bad for cognitive development and so on. But now, this literature has disappeared because why? Because the attitudes to English have, have completely changed in this society under the political pressures that it's under. So, so, you know, it would, 
it would take it, you need to write a PhD to, to map this. I say to the students today, when I came to Hong Kong, people are complaining bitterly about English in education and its cognitive effects. And they look at me blankly because for them, <laughs> you know, they, they've integrated English into their social identities and their political identities. And, and so, so this is why you have to, you know, this is a very complex post-colonial society, which is evolving very rapidly. So, so the arguments, what maybe is, you know, um, the arguments, you know, even about um, cognitive stuff fall away in a particular political context. Because you know? people here, the students here don't have a problem, at least they don't write essays anymore saying what a, what a pain it is to study in English and mother tongue mm -hmm. would be better. So that's just to emphasize the, the deeply contextual nature of this concept and what we say about it. Yeah, I agree yeah. entirely. The translanguaging is problematic because as, as Alan Bell said, you start off, people start off their articles for the journal saying no, languages don't exist and then they go through the article using language Because no, 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 no. <laughs> we don't, what are we going to do with these categories, you know? We should, you know so that we're in a very interesting moment, I think, in this, uh, in this debate or this, you know, about the meta language. What is the meta language? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? mm. And can mm. there be, or should there be, and this is something I, you know, linguistics was originally trying to set up a universal meta language. And that goes into fishman Kloss, right? There's going to be a terminology mm. you can apply to post-colonial states or decolonizing states globally to kind of diagnose and then I think this fell apart, you know, uh, rightly so, actually. But then how do we think comparatively without a meta language? So, <laughs> mm. you know, it's, um, mm. I, I keep going mm. round and round in my head about these issues. Mm. Mm. Yes, I think I, I agree with you that ultimately it's a debate about the nature of the meta language that we use. And I can see the problem, the, the dilemmas that translanguage specialists find themselves in. Languages don't, don't exist or languages exist. And then um, when, when they encounter um, a piece of text, then they go around naming those particular um, elements, say this Tosa, this Twana, etc. So part of the analysis, they don't exist, then you are naming them. In, in, using this particular category. I think it's an issue about uh, meta language. And Peter Jones, in a um, chapter that he wrote with Dorothy Duncan for all of my books, um, extends this discussion to notions about transcription, that uh, what you have with transcriptions as well is that people then transcribe these uh, whatever conversations that people make. And they end up with the impression that the the transcript without being fully aware that the transcription, whatever form it, it takes, is also in the process of creating a particular visual representation of language. But then the question that is there is, uh, can you do any analysis without some form of transcription? <laughs> right. Or you have to do some transcription. And Peter and Dr. I think, are right about transcription. But then the question is, uh, if a graduate student were to ask you, so what do I do? I mean, how do I handle this? How can I analyze this data if I don't transcribe uh, transcribe it? Unless you get back and say, oh, but there's n nothing called data in terms of language. Then that's another different philosophical debate that you enter into. Mm. Mm. Yeah, anyway, that was just my... Another very interesting question uh, from Dr. Christine Severo about um, the right over mother tongue claimed by indigenous peoples. Um, uh, Dr. Severo, would you like to ask a question? Thanks, Magda. So uh, I would just follow Professor Hajan's question. Uh, can't we think of a kind of strategical essentialism in relation to language when, for example, indigenous peoples reclaim the right of their mother tongue as part of a deep movement of identity affirmation and recognition? How would we consider the discourses on native languages used by indigenous to claim their dignity? today. And I would also ask another question if, if consider uh, the relation between colonialism and 
theology and religion. Can't we think of uh, this idea of mother tongue or native language connected to Christianism or a Christian invention since Latin was considered a sacred language? And if you want to have access to truth, that this access is just through sacred languages like Latin. And thanks, thanks. Yeah, thanks. I mean, um, I think, again, this is about the context that you look at. So uh, people uh, who are in a particular historical situation need to use the tools that they have. And some mm -hmm. of these have been given to them or imposed on them. But nonetheless, they are powerful tools because they also are recognizable within the sort of colonial or post-colonial national state. So they're using categories which presumably are not originally in their indigenous languages, mm -hmm. presumably, but nonetheless, it's a, it's a way of transacting with the state in a, in a way mm -hmm. that is recognizable to the state. It can, mm -hmm. you know, there are studies of, the, of, of these kind of paradoxes that you get with the state essentializing and, you know, the different forms of essentialization that go on. But so, I mean, um, even, you know, notions of, of ownership, so this is a key thing in relation to land. So you, you may have assertions about kinds of ownership which would be foreign to the pre-colonial culture, but nonetheless within the legal order with which people find themselves makes sense. Just like for Native American tribes, they can incorporate themselves or they can, you know, they can use various legal forms in order to, uh, to assert kinds of ownership over intellectual property and so on. So, so I don't have a, you know, so I, um, that's why I say you really must be delicate about the context. I would hate to, you know, mm. it'd be an odd thing to, you know, first the missionaries come and say you have this mother tongue, <laughs> then some integration terms say actually it's a complete construct, you know, it would be appalling <laughs> and, and ridiculous. And I think there are good reasons, you know, so um, these, these are very powerful ideas. And once they're, you know, once they enter a society, they can be used in many different ways. And so it's not, it's not, you know, it's not for me to say, what people should do with these concepts. It's just that I, I, working from the one that I was looking at, it was kind of a shock to me, I think, because of my, so I think on the issue of mother tongue, so you have the reformation, which is exactly a rebellion against the notion that an institution should mediate between, in a, in a language you can't understand between you and God. So, mm. and so that is, you know, maybe not discussed enough in the history of linguistics, you know, because this is such a, profound revolution so luther you know the bible mm -hmm. and so on and so i can i don't need a necessarily a cast of priests and a pope to mediate between me and god so i don't need of course you end up creating a a high variety of german so a kind of church german but so you you don't get away with uh, you don't get a leveling you know but you get you know playing with the vernacular Bible and so on. So, yeah, I, I think so. So um, I guess in, you know, parts of the world, the first missionaries were Jesuits, but they did also do linguistics. But mm. I think you have this, you have this in China, which I know a bit better, where you have the early Catholic missionaries are going to the top of the society and trying to convert from the top. And you have radical Protestants in the 19th century who sound like Marxists, who were saying, you know, the writing system is elitist, and we need to use vernacular and dialect and you need to write the Bible. So they can teach someone to read the Bible in a few weeks in a Romanized Chinese. So, so it's a radical, it's a radical, and it, it is empowering in a sense, women, you know, women get educated by missionaries. And so I, you know, there's a whole set of difficult issues there, I think, um, uh, um, which, <laughs> which defeat me because I just go around in circles. But yeah, yeah, the point is well taken. Yes. That, um, uh, people, um, these, these concepts that circulate globally can be appropriated and adapted and uh, taken on and, and become meaningful, yes. Mm -hmm. And used, in a, used to resist different forms of, of um, attempts to level or wipe out or you know, attack particular cultures, yeah. Just we're, we're cursed with the wider frame and the sort of historical awareness of, of things, I guess, you know. Um, that reflexivity which mm. makes mm. everything much more difficult yeah. but there are there are anyways yes enough anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have we have so many more questions um 
Uh, Ashraf, would you like to ask your question? Who is Ashraf? Yes. You're uh, muted. Okay. Yes. Uh, can, you, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you so yes, much, yes. Uh, 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 Professor Hatton. Uh, it's very Holy interesting. Christ. Yes, uh, I actually want to take some issue with the way trans language is used because you talked about it and I, I tried to raise this uh, with Simfri. Um, uh, my, my understanding is that um, trans languaging, uh, the way it's used now in the literature, uh, eradicates uh, or conflates practice with ideology. Mm -hmm. Because as I understand trans languaging, it focuses on processes and practices of meaning making. Now, the question is where does ideology fit? There's mm -hmm. no talk about it. So I, I, I think this is a problem uh, uh, which we need to address. The second thing, when you say language doesn't exist, who is the audience for this statement? It's not, it's, it can't be the audience on the street, the man or the woman on the street. It could be the linguist, and I think it is the linguist. We are trying to do battle within the field, saying to our colleague who reified language, that language in the way it's reified or uh, fetishized doesn't exist in the street. But I think the problem here is that we have taken this debate to the street. And we are saying to people, well, language doesn't exist. <laughs> you are translanguaging. You can't say it to your mother. You are translanguaging, mother, or to your friend. You are just translanguaging. So I think this is a problem we need to deal with. Um, the question of ideology. It has to be addressed. The second point, the notion of mother tongue in uh, the Arabic tradition, I have I've tried to look for this notion, for the phrase itself, it doesn't exist in the Arabic tradition. Mother tongue as a phrase is imported from the West into Arabic linguistics. And, but interestingly, is it was reconceptualized, was linked with the standard. It's not linked with the race. And, and this dynamic also has to be taken into, I think, account when we theorize the notion of mother tongue outside the Western uh, traditional linguistics. The last point is that about the native language. The concept of native language is not synonymous with the concept, concept of mother tongue, because sometimes we use it. So my question here is, uh, I got the implication that the notion of mother tongue is also linked somehow with the notion of the modern nation state. So can you, can you elaborate on this point, please? Thank you very much. Um, the f I, I'm not sure about the translanguaging. I have to defer to others on that. I, but I, um, because I, I've noticed there's an explosion of literature in which I haven't been keeping up with, but I'm sure you have a point there. I just, I can't give you a good answer about that, but I, because um, I'm not following the literature, but I, I do, I very much agree with you about your second point. I remember going home to see my father and saying, there's a professor at Oxford, he says, languages don't exist. And my father looked at me like, you guys are up there in Oxford wasting your time. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and he had a point, but Harris actually, at least rhetorically, did say that lay speakers or ordinary, he used, you know, the ordinary mm -hmm. speaker has, has these concepts of work, has the only concept of a language worth having. So they make sense. So exactly as you said, that linguists have made these a kind of specialized currency and it sits uneasily with these ordinary language, ordinary concepts which circulate socially. I still think there's a problem there because um, uh, who's a lay speaker and what's, you know, mm. where the lay ideas come from and, what is the relationship between experts back to expertise and who's to critique, you know, so, but of, that's why back to, it would be ridiculous for me to go to an indigenous people and say, you guys, your language is a construct, you know, which they're clinging on to, you know? So um, it, I think I've, I've become more and more interested in that actually in relation to law where, where you have judges, linguists, you know, you have all these people who are trying to work out what words mean and, um, so, uh, an arguing about who has a better theory of what words mean, and it actually has practical consequences. And I think, I think we should think more about 
the social circulation of linguistic ideas. Obviously, if people go through formal education, they come out with a with what Harris would call the language myth. You know, now there are nouns and verbs. There's you know grammatical structures. Words have meanings and so on. Um, so, I I do fear there's a danger of romanticizing ordinary speakers as well. So, you know, they live in a pre-categorical world of, you know, and so I. I, I think there's a lot to think about in, in your point there. Yeah. Um, and um, nation state, because the, it's again back to the Reformation. So you have the idea of the idea of authentic membership of, uh, of an institution or a state. So um, that's why Germany is so important because Germany had a language before it had a state. So people were in a way members of the German folk before they were citizens of a German state. So, there's something uh, so powerful about this idea of this again romantic idea of integration into uh, into a you know um, into a kind of organic unity. So this is the vernacular idea of nationalism, and of course it has a liberational side again because it means that the language of government is the language of the home or the language of school, at least is some variant of the language of home, and that gives that sounds more liberal, democratic, and that's the Protestant. That's the argument for Protestantism in a way. Um, you know, Bowen and Briggs have this discussion about, you know, there's also a coercive or purifying moment, you know, where the nation state um, creates a kind of pure variety and marginalizes. So Germany, you know, was massively in our terms, multi-ethnic, multicultural, you know, the pre-modern, the sort of German state as it was in the late 18th and early 19th century, the German territories. You know, it was full of all kinds of languages and varieties. And then you get this concept reified of German huh? and standard German sort of imposed onto it. So, um, but uh, I guess this, and this model, you know, of, of a nation state, you know, became more and more powerful with the breakup of these large European empires. So the Austro-Hungarian empire. So we're still living with the consequences also of the Ottoman empire. Mm. That one of the things that broke these empires was the idea of mother tongue or, nation states you know based on language or culture um not only but this is one of the aspects of it so um so uh i, I think this is you know one of the most important ideas in modern in modern history and of course colonialism exports the idea of um of a uh, particular model of nationalism I think, mm. you know, uh, the nation state which has proved highly problematic obviously not just in Europe, but everywhere. You know. So you have China, which is still basically an imperial polity. And it, it dealt with the internal variation by reifying people into different nationalities. Uh, it's as if the Ottoman Empire, if, it's as if Turkey was the Ottoman Empire. That's China, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know. Did I answer, did I answer your question? <laughs> Please follow up if you... Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was. I'm sorry about the translanguaging. I, I didn't. I don't have a yeah, good answer for you. Yeah, the, yeah. It's, it's just my argument is that you know uh, that the notion of translanguaging is the way it's used depoliticizes linguistics. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because it divorces actually, it, it eradicates or it put puts under erasure the whole notion of ideology. People just focus on practice. So okay, there is the notion of language is not there in practice. But what about ideology? And here they focus on. Uh, ideology as professional as it's used in professional linguistics, but, but but they forget to focus on folk ideologies. I can give you a good example. For example, take the notion of uh, the work of Ferguson, Charles Ferguson, Diglossia, because it's, yep. uh, it's used here. Okay, they they say well uh, Ferguson's got it wrong because we trans language. Uh, okay, it's not high and low, but again, Ferguson paid attention to the notion of ideology in his paper also that the idea of the singular uh, uh, singular language is there in the mind of the speaker. That's why we can, we can, we can, they can translanguage, you see what I mean? Yes, uh, yes. So, and this, and this also will lead us to your, your point of, on uh, uh, lexicography, because I know I, I have downloaded actually your, uh, legally or illegally, I have downloaded your uh, uh, dictionary on the Cantonese, uh, slang is very interesting. So uh, it's, it's, it's slang, 
seems like you're, you're doing battle against establishment, right? A dictionary on a slang, on the language of the street. So what's the point uh, behind that? Because it somehow links to the notion of mother tongue, the word slang, you see what I mean? It just, it's the same thing as I have today. I was frustrated because I was trying to learn Cantonese and I, all the words that I heard around me, I couldn't find in a dictionary. <laughs> and so, so I, you know, and I, it was a, it's still a painful process, you know, so, you know, I still, so again, with this huge political argument debate, there's a massive amount of linguistic creativity going on, but the lexicographers are, mo are nowhere near catching up with it. Mm -hmm. So I started making a list in my office. It's, the days go by, I'm sitting here. So, um, and uh, I don't know if I'll publish it, but I just was so struck by the, uh, because again, the dynamic vernacular, yes, this, this incredibly complex, especially with the social media, unbelievable what's going on in, in, in what would be called translanguaging, but you know, in, in, the, in the sort of mixing, just on the, but I understood translanguaging to, they think of themselves as political, right? Um, I mean, they, I, I get the affect coming from translanguaging is, is a, uh, it does seem to be situating itself politically, or am I wrong? That's what I found. But, well, I think they, they, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a discussion, of course, it's a, it's a, it's a controversial issue, but the, because they focus, it, it, that's, this is my view. Yeah, they try to say the, uh, you know, the Western linguistics has constructed or created language and imposed it on the non-Western context, and that's right, and particularly in the, in the colonial period. But the way now it's used to do research in non-Western context actually is, as I see it, is seriously depoliticizing, you know, because the question What's of ideology, happening? they focus on the practice. What's, uh, What's happening to Ashraf? Sorry? Still free, I, I didn't, didn't. Yes, we can, we can hear you, Ashraf. Yeah, because Still free intervened. Yeah, I, I, as I said, yes, it's, uh, as I understand it, the argument actually uh, well, the argument on translanguaging emerged as an action against the autonomous mainstream linguistic theory, Western linguistic theory. That's understood. But now it's used in non-Western context. And the question of ideology, you rarely find the word ideology as it's used in folk uh, conceptualization of language, in local non-professional understanding of language. Because people go around and say, well, people are translanguaging, okay, the notion of autonomous single language is not there. Full stop. That's some of the research which I, uh, I read outside the context of the. So, as I understand it, it was, uh, it, it emerged as a tool of resistance against the mainstream understanding of language in the Western theory. But now it's used to, to, do, to do violence when it's used in other contexts. As that's how I understand it. Um, because. Okay, the, I see your point. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Thank you. Because it's missing out the folk models or the yes you know, the folk the, the actual the folk. people yeah yeah I mean folk not in a sort of dismissive sense but actually in a in a sense yes, of people exactly have what investment in in notions of language which are you know including hierarchies and standards and so on you know. yes the folk ideologies of language that's precisely what I what I meant okay. thank you. Uh, thank you, Ashraf. Now I see that Dr. McConney joined um, uh, Boosie <laughs> on another computer. <laughs> um, okay, uh, let's continue. We don't have much time. There's a really interesting conversation going on in the chat. Um, and there are many questions about still translanguaging. <laughs> um, uh, maybe I will pick up the one by Un um, Jong Lee. Uh, there were some comments about your, uh, your question too. Would you like to, um, to ask your question? Oh, uh, sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your work. I really enjoyed your 2010 article in Language Ownership too, which I, which I had, a, had a chance to talk about. But I think my uh, comment was more like a really comment, not really a question. So the way that I understand translanguaging, um, which I cannot really speak for everybody because it has been more or less interdisciplinary, discussion that has evolved in education, also um, composition and rhetoric field, as well as applied linguists. So I think depending on 
I mean, we're talking about the, like, your positionality and whose work you're reading also defines how you understand translanguaging. But uh, my, I personally read um, a lot of translanguaging literature from Filia Garcia and Ricardo Otegai, um, and also some of the language uh, scholars in composition and rhetoric like Bruce Horner um, and also Suresh Kanaraja. So the way that I understand translanguaging is really about your positionalities, not, and I, I have to slightly disagree with the idea that translanguaging may disagree or overlooks folks, uh, folk ideology of language. I actually, to me, translanguaging really tries to um, highlight on that, the idea that it really is built upon, uh, from the perspective of bilinguals, who grow up or engage or navigate or work around that very idea of named language categories. So in that sense, I don't think they disagree or disregard um, the idea of named language categories or even monolingual ideologies. I think actually they're trying to claim the very fact that we live with the consequence of language ideology. And one way that people live with that ideology is uh, that they feel very afraid to translanguage, but also there's a group of people who grow up actually contesting their boundaries. Um, so that's where I stand in terms of translanguage. Um, I don't know if you have any comment on that perspective of how translanguage kind of focuses on perspective from within rather than from up top down as from the linguist. I mean, there's, there's always this problem that the moment you enter a linguistic analysis, you are, you are moving out of the, you know, you're moving into becoming an outsider. So I, I, I don't, I mean, maybe Ashraf would like to respond, but uh, sorry, I've got to, but uh, I do think there's a fascinating and intricate problem about insider outsider categories and, and um, uh, the different forms of ideology. And I think maybe this is a good way, you know, what you're saying is, and you know, Ashra, back and forth with Ashraf, that would be an interesting dialogue about um, thinking about this because I do think for the history of linguistics, they haven't, because there's an assumption of the expert until, you know, which I think is, uh, and an expert with a method, that was the model, I think. So I think that now is being questioned but sort of anthropologically and that's very healthy. Yeah. So I, that's a kind of weak response to what you say, but yeah. Can, can, I, can I add something here just to make myself clear? It's, uh, it's very interesting, yes. If the notion of language is an ideological, is an ideological construct, and if, as uh, uh, Christopher said, you know, the for formal education leaves its traces in this, ideology, in this ideological understanding of language, then even though we, at the level of practice, we are translanguaging, even not just bilinguals, because the notion actually even well, the notion of monolingualism itself is, is, is an ideological concept. But let's say uh, even within what we consider one language, people are, people are translanguaging at the level of practice. So, but if the notion of language as a singular exists, now the question is, it can exist at a particular level of reality, uh, not, or a, that reality can be an imagination, can be a language myth in the... In the, in the and the folk understanding, I mean, the folk ideologies of the person in the street. Put, put it crudely, at the level of practice, yes, there is no, the, the idea of the boundary is not there. But at the level of imagination, in the mind of the person on the street, the idea of the singular language is there. Now the question is how to reveal, how to explore, how to study. Now the notion of the meta language, the notion of meta translanguaging as a meta, linguistic tool erases that possibility because we go there with the idea that no, there is no ide language ideology, that the, the notion of the singular language is not there. People, we just focus on practice and we come out and we describe that practice. So that level of reality, which is in the mind, is, is, is erased through the, through the research itself. That's the point. I, I don't know, can I respond to that real quick? <laughs> I, I think, as I said, I don't think translanguaging scholars deny that there is a reality. I shouldn't say there is a reality. I don't think translanguaging scholars would necessarily 
deny that we live with the consequence of monolingual ideology, which one of which is the category of name language, right? What, uh, what I mean, given my limited understanding of evolving scholarship, what I think they're highlighting is the, 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 the effect of what we have to deal with, and one of which is like translanguaging. Um, and I think that says something about how we want to see the reality and from whose perspective, because as we talked about, there are multiple perspectives, right? There are linguists who has, um, who, there are linguists uh, who label language and describes language and um, name things, but that is one perspective. And what, 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 I, what I find translanguaging helpful is that they're trying to push back that that's not the only perspective um, in understanding linguistic reality. And in doing so, I think, I, I see that there is a risk of perhaps minimizing the actual reality that pe where people feel the pressure of monolingual ideology. Yes, I do agree with that. Um, but the framework itself, again, I think it, it comes down upon our responsibility as a scholar to make it clear that where you stand in terms of um, using that framework and to what end. And by doing so, whose perspective you are foregrounding. Um, so that's just my short comment. Thank you very much, Oh Jung. Um, uh, we already reached uh, our 90 minutes of discussion time, so probably some of you, you already have some, some other plans. However, as I mentioned before, I will stop recording, but I know that we still have some questions in the chat. Uh, so if you wish to stay for uh, some more minutes, <coughs> informal part of the session, you are very welcome um, to do so. I know we had questions from Desmond, from Unierie, uh, so uh, you're welcome to stay. I will just stop recording our session. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for your inspiring questions, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hatton, for your participation. If you just read in the chat, there are many warm words of uh, gratitude for your participation today. Thank you. I'm really grateful. I mean, I've been kind of isolated the last you know, few weeks. <laughs> it's wonderfully um, exciting to have a sort of global conversation like this. It's really great. Instead of just, you know, you know the, the corridor is empty, you know, today. <laughs> we have a, a new virus wave. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you.